first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. One of the things that I hear a lot, you know, because everyone knows what we have just gone through in Chicago, I get told, well, now you get now you're getting to rest, right? You get to rest a little bit. Mm. And I reply for a brief minute. And I say that because even while we were at the negotiations table, at the bargaining table, we were still being told about what the next battle would be. Because we just emerged, what we just emerged from is a battle. But it is a battle in a larger war. This is a war against participatory democracy, grassroots democracy, public participation. It's a war against all things public. And, and I want to start from that angle because one of the things that we do when we go out and we talk to our members and we talk to our community is we sort of like all of us have a habit of thinking global and acting local. We start, we have a big picture, and then we start with that big picture and we go from there to, okay, what can we do? What will we do? What do we do now? There's a war against all things public. Public welfare, <coughs> public property, public lands, public transportation, public institutions. The whole idea of something public being inferior and bad, you know, when you think of things like uh, public beaches as opposed to a private beach. When you think of something like a public restroom, it doesn't particularly bring up salutary associations. <laughs> <laughs> and now, when you think of public workers, you think of someone that's inefficient, ineffective, only there for a paycheck. And that's when it circles around to teachers. Teachers used to be highly respected in this society and in this culture, but now we are being denigrated and abused. We are being blamed for the ills of society. I guess someone has to be a scapegoat. <laughs> so public teachers and public education at this point is being stigmatized and denigrated. Now bear in mind, there is an educational problem in this country, but it's not due to the teachers, it's due to poverty. We have a poverty problem in this country, and in order to avoid talking about the elephant in the room, someone has chosen to find scapegoats. And those scapegoats happen to be ours. And I guess I got this red shirt on. I'm a bullseye right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the reply to this problem is some, this so-called school reform movement, which, as Brother Ford has uh, outlined for us, is actually a market-driven reform movement or corporate reform. There are those who believe that the market model is going to save education in this country, as though it needs to be saved. And this is backed by certain groups of people. Now, we know about the right-wing think tanks, and we know about the associations and all that. But a lot of this goes back to let me call them the big three, because we know that we're up against billionaires. And those billionaires are people like Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Eli and Edith Broad Foundation, and the Walmart 
it's a foundation backed by Walmart. I don't know what the name of it, but we know what we all know what Walmart is about. And a lot of this money, we have billions of dollars that are being pushed into this whole <coughs> so-called school reform movement, and it comes in the form of a media war. It comes in the form of this denigration of the teachers. And basically, what they're attempting to do and what they are doing in the process of doing is overhauling and undermining publication, uh, public education through concepts like choice, competition, deregulation, accountability, and data-based decision-making. And the way that they are doing this are through such vehicles as charters, charter schools, which we have just heard about, high stakes tests, standardized tests, I'm sure you're very familiar with those, merit pay, the idea of merit pay for educators as if we go into education to get rich. <laughs> I don't know any educator that went into teaching to get rich. Uh, these massive longitudinal data collection systems that will track and correlate, tra track uh, students all the way from the beginning of their career to the end and correlate them with uh, all of the educators they have come in contact with. And then there's this model of what they call uh, school improvement, which is based upon closing schools, phasing them out, Turning them around, and for those of you that are not familiar with the turnaround model, it basically means you get rid of all the adults in the school and bring in a whole new staff. And then there's one that we don't hear very much about is, a, a, I think, the, the transformation model, where you uh, get rid of the principal and re retrain the staff. But we don't hear a lot about that. <laughs> but anyway, I want to go back to the fact that this is pushed by certain people for their own interest. It's called venture philanthropy. Has anyone heard of that term before? You know, venture philanthropy is what drives a lot of this. It's not like the old vision of philanthropy where you give money and, and, and these institutions, you know, survive and they thrive. With venture philanthropy, not only do you donate the money, but you come in with a script mm -hmm. of how this organization that, is, that has received the money is supposed to operate, and you come in with a time schedule on how, what benchmarks they're supposed <coughs> to hit at a certain time. In other words, you pretty much take over that organization that you are supposedly uh, being a benefactor to. So that is what's driving a lot of what's going on in this so-called school reform movement. We race to the top, <coughs> intimately correct, connected with that. A lot of money went into that $4.3 billion that was used in a leveraged manner because the whole public educational industry that we're talking about <coughs> is a $500 billion industry. So $4 billion is just, just a lot of money unless you leverage it in the right way. Unless you say, well, look here, I'm going to put this money out here in front of you, but you have to do certain things, and whoever does these things the best will get this money. And that's basically how it works. In order for a state originally <coughs> to get a piece of that $4.3 billion, they had to fill out certain applications saying that they were going to do this, this, and this. Those applications had to do with increasing charter schools, bringing in the high stakes, high stakes tests, bringing in merit pay, implementing these large data systems. If you do all of that, that puts you in a position where you can compete for this money. Now, only so many people are going to get it. But whoever competes the best gets the money. So that's a way that you can leverage, because everybody's going after it. Not everyone is going to get it. But still, because you have it out there, and you have it as a contest, as a competition, 
everyone's going to go after it. Well, not, not all 50 states went for it the first time because not everyone wanted to overhaul their educational system. So now we have a new reiteration of it where it goes by district. You can sidestep the state and you can have each particular district compete for this round of Race to the Top funds. But that's basically how you leverage the leverage of funds to overhaul this system. Not only that, but because you have so much money uh, floating around <coughs> in the name of education reform, what we have been seeing are these, what we call astroturf groups, these fake grassroots groups like <laughs> Stand for Children. Anyone that heard of Stand for Children? Democrats for Education Reform, mm -hmm. both of which had been in Chicago, both of which had been main uh, opponents of our union. And they even brought in, they even spun off another group at the end called Education Reform Now. <coughs> So they, these groups pretty much, they grow like mushrooms. But that's basically what the war was about. It was a war to save not just public education, but all things public. And because of that, because the teachers were being attacked, and we knew it was part of a wider battle, we were able to reach out to find more allies because we were able to connect the dots and let everyone know, look, this is not just about us. We are, to, this is not just about the Chicago Teachers Union. We are fighting for the soul of public education. Mm -hmm. And we need public, if you believe in democracy, participatory democracy, democracy with a small d then you need to believe in public education and try to save public education. We just emerged from a titanic battle. Chicago got a new mayor, one of the most powerful men in the world. And we were told that you know, you better be careful. You can't, you can't go up against this person. You know, everybody, he's beat up so many other people down, and you will be just one more victim. But we had to fight. We fought because we knew we had to fight. <coughs> and we also fought because that's what we do, and that's what we have been doing for some time. You see, this battle for a decent contract that we went through, did not just start last year or with the contract negotiations. We geared up for that years ago. Now, specifically for the contract, we started two years ago when my administration came into office. But there's a prehistory also. There was an organization put together before we came into office called the Grassroots Education Movement. And it was an umbrella organization of community organizations, um, caucus of the teachers union. Myself, I had an organization that was networking what we call local school councils. All of those that had an interest, we had a number of groups that had an interest in education that came together for the sake of salvaging public <coughs> education. That's how I came to meet this group called CORE, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators. I want to tell you a little bit about CORE. That is the reform, well, I hate to use that word reform because it's become such a bad word, but that is the group that, uh, the caucus, the progressive caucus that I was with, that challenged the, the traditional leadership of the union. And we took the helm of the union in July, of, of the Chicago Teachers Union in July of 2010. And what's amazing about poor is it's, it's as if we came from nowhere. Maybe two years before that election, a little, not even two years before that election, there was no core. A 
around two years before that election, there were a small group of teachers that got together as a book club. They came together reading a book, they discussed the book, and as they were going through the discussion, the book discussions, they started seeing a lot of links to what was going on in the educational milieu and started thinking, look, we need to, to do something. We need to put these ideas into action. I know there are a lot of you out there now thinking, I wonder what that book was. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone ever heard of the Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein? Yeah. That was the book. That was the book that we had. To, uh, well, I was not with the group at that time, but that uh, I had read the book separately. But that's where CORE started as a book club, and from there we had the battle because we were in the midst of something called. Renaissance 2010 in Chicago <laughs> at that time, which was the turnaround model being pushed by none other than Arnie Duncan. I'm sure all of you have heard him, about him now. Because what you need to understand is the Chicago, that Chicago is pretty much the epicenter of what's going on with this so-called school reform <coughs> movement across this nation right now. It was practiced in Chicago in the early 2000s, the turning around and the closing of schools and the bringing and the turning over to the charters and all of that. Arne Duncan, it, it happened before Arne Duncan. I believe it started under, under a guy named Paul Ballas. Then Arne Duncan picked up the torch. <coughs> and later on, he was boosted up to the federal level, and he basically took the show on the road. So now we all know about it, about the turnaround model. Anyway, the group core got very serious about stopping what was going on in Chicago, the closing of the neighborhood schools, of the community schools. And for those of you that know <coughs> Chicago, you know it is a very violent city. It is violent for a number of reasons, but one of which is that there's a gang problem in Chicago, and the gangs have territories. And when you start shutting down schools in one territory and force those children from those schools to go into another territory, you can imagine what the results are. One of those problems happened to blow up and go viral um, with the Darien Albert. And how many of you have heard of what happened with the Darien Albert incident, where a young man from one, one school at uh, Finger, it was called Finger, was beaten to death because of a school <coughs> fight between, basically, between two neighborhoods. They called it a gang fight, but because I taught in one of the neighborhoods, that was involved in that, I can tell you that it was not really a gang fight. It was the conflict between neighborhoods. That's another thing that you have going on in Chicago. But that was one of the tragic results of what happens when you don't have community schools. And you have, you have students, children, that have to go from their home neighborhood into hostile territory just to get an education. But anyway, we, uh, CORE got in the midst of trying to, attempting to stop the school closings. Um, we started in 2009. We were a bit successful each year, 2009, 2010. We were pretty successful. Then we got a new mayor. How many of you have heard of uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel? <laughs> the new mayor of Chicago. And things got a little bit more serious then. And once again, you know, we were told that we were in trouble. But anyway, from fighting the school closings, we decided that we had to up the ante a little bit more. 
And that's when we put together a slate to run for control of the Chicago Teachers Union. <coughs> and as not just luck, but a lot of preparation and a lot of work and a lot of organization would have it, we took the helm of the Chicago Teachers Union in July of 2010. And when we did that, we came in with a whole different idea of how a union should work. We wanted to go from what was called a service model, what's known as a service model of the union, to an organizing model of the union. We wanted to become a more militant union because we knew we were in the midst of a war and we knew that we had plenty of battles ahead of us. So we did a number of things to prepare our union for the fights that we knew we had ahead, coming ahead. One part of becoming a more militant union was to start shifting the funds. You know, we, did, we, we felt as though we didn't need these really large officer salaries <laughs> because you only have so much money. And we needed to have what something that's a few things that we did not have within our office, like an organizing department. So the officers capped their salaries, and we started creating other departments within, that we knew that we needed within the Chicago Teachers Union. One of which was, as I said, an organizing department. We had a small research department but we had to expand that because research is very, very important in this battle that we have. As you know, when they talk about no child left behind, as opposed to, you know, when that came up, they were talking about, well, we have to have these research-based practices, which I don't think they ever had. But under what's going on now with the school reform movement, none of these uh, practices are research-based. They're ideologically driven. But there is such a thing as using research to improve education. And we believe in doing that. So we expanded our research department. We doubled down on our media relations because we knew that we had to change the image, not just of the union, but of teachers in general and the relationship that the teachers had with the public and with the community. We brought in very skilled labor attorneys. Now you have a lot of different type of labor attorneys. You know, you got these labor management attorneys, which is we have it on the other side of the table, million dollar attorneys that whose main job was to bust unions. We had to find the right type of attorneys that were able to work with us on that, and we did. We found some excellent attorneys to work with us. When we started with a contract. We knew we had to get a new contract. Our contract was going to expire. And we planned ahead of time for that. Two years from the very beginning, we put in contract committees. Committees of people that would go out into the schools and familiarize our members with the contract, get their ideas on what would be a better contract. We had already had existing committees within our union, but they pretty much weren't doing a lot of things that we felt that they needed to do. And we used these committees also to get more ideas on how do we get a better contract. A contract not, that, that's not just coming from the leadership, but pulls ideas from the rank and file. Because after all, four is about is the caucus of rank and file members. And we, we, we believe in that. We were holding regional meetings in the schools with clusters of schools. We felt it was very, very important to come face to face with our members, our leadership, all of the officers. We made ourselves highly accessible. We went out to the schools, talked to our members. 
I go out, I give my memory by cell phone. I tell them, just call me. You know, whenever you need me, call my office, call me. We actually answer our, all of our emails that we get from our members. We are very, very accessible to our members. But one of the most important things that we did is we had not only to organize our members, but we had to break down walls. We had to break down the walls between, within our members, between the teachers and the paraprofessionals and the clinicians so that we could have union solidarity. And then we, we also had to break down the walls between the teachers and the public that we serve, the parents and the students. So we went out and we, had, we, we met with the community. We met with the local school councils. We had our teachers go out and do that. We had our delegates go out and do that. All of that together is what helped us to transform our union and broaden our base for the battle that we had ahead. I see I have to wrap up, up soon, so I'm going to try to go a little bit quicker here. One, another thing that we did with that I think was very revolutionary is when we sat down to do the actual bargaining for our contract, usually bargaining, people think of that as like this backdoor deal where the leadership gets together with their side and they figure out what they're going to do. We brought in a bargaining committee of about 40 members, and we pulled them from all segments of our, of our uh, educational population. We had teachers from high school, teachers from elementary school, we had paraprofessionals, we had clinicians, and they were there as part of our bargaining team. Now, the other side, they did not like that at all. They said, hey, this is the way you're supposed to do this. But we insisted upon it. Threw them off balance. It really threw them off balance. But we got really good ideas, and we, got, we came up with a contract that really represented the interest of our members. And so moving ahead quickly here, because I know it's time to wrap up, the bottom line is, we were up against an intransigent and arrogant group. They would not listen to us. They would not bargain with us. So in order to make them, make them be reasonable with us, we had to go on a, on a campaign. We had to publish polls. We had to, we had to hit them in the media. We had to do massive rallies and street demonstrations. We had to take uh, 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 um, uh, 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 an exercise vote where our members just practiced how they were going to vote on the contract. We took a massive strike authorization vote among our members and then we finally took a strike vote where we had 98% of our membership agree to go out with us. back to 90 when you put it all together because we had spoiled votes and some that didn't vote and all of that so the official number was 90 but when you count the ones that did vote all of the votes it was 98 percent and then finally and I'll wrap up with this when it came time to ratify the contract that we came up with among our members we had over 79 percent of our members ratify our contract which is the highest contract ratification in, in our history, in our union's history. So I, I'm pretty sure that they were pleased with what we had. But like I said, that was one battle in the course of the longer war. Our next step is what they have threatened us with. They are threatening to shut down a number of schools and increase the chaos in our city. And that is the battle that we have to